A continuously variable transmission, or CVT for short, just refers to any mechanism that allows you to vary the gear ratio from the input to the output continuously between its highest and lowest ratio. The simplest and most common mechanism you'll see for this uses two cones with a belt between them like this. It lets us vary the speed, and therefore also the torque, of the output continuously by moving the position of the belt. While this is a very elegant design, it has one major problem, which is that, with just a little bit of resistance, the belt starts slipping, and the output completely stops. It takes a little more force to stop it if I set it to the highest gear ratio, since the output has a bit more torque, but it's still very easy to stop it, which means this really wouldn't work well for powering something like a car in its current form. My first idea was to gear up the input, and then gear down the output. What this does is it makes the CVT run at a higher speed, but with lower torque. In this case, with this gear ratio, we're speeding it up by 3 times at the input, and then slowing it down by 3 times at the output. So, the output speed and torque are the exact same as before, but now the cones and bolts kind of feel less of this torque. So if I apply a certain force on the output, it's like the bolt only feels a third of this force, so more force is needed before it slips. This is pretty cool, and it certainly helps, but it doesn't fix the problem, and with just a bit more force the belt still slips, especially when it's in its higher gears. It's also got the downside that, since there's always going to be some friction when you're using a rubber band as a belt like this, this friction gets multiplied by the gear ratio you've added onto the input, so the motor has to work harder to overcome it. And this is why I couldn't just make these gear ratios on the input and output higher and higher, until the output could give us enough torque for whatever we need. So, with that off the table, I started thinking about how I could make the belt itself more grippy, so it's less likely to slip. Since so far I've been using this really thin rubber band, and on these really smooth cones, I thought there was going to be a lot of potential in making them more grippy. First off, I switched out the rubber band for this much wider one, hoping that the larger contact area would make the belt slip a lot less. Unfortunately, this wasn't what happened, and the thicker belt only made a slight improvement. I have a couple of theories as for why this happened. It could be that this rubber band is smoother and less grippy than the other one, or that, because the belt covers such a wide section of the cones, only the thicker side of the cone actually makes a firm contact with the belt. Speaking of which, the wider belt meant it was a lot harder to slide it along the cones, and I found that it was a lot harder to turn as well. My theory is that this is because the wider belt is covering the cones over quite a wide range of thicknesses, so the different parts of the cone are actually trying to pull the belt at different speeds. But regardless, it was clear to me that this really hadn't solved the problem at all. I mentioned before that I could also try making the cones less smooth to improve the grip, by using pieces with a texture, something like this. And while this might have helped, it would have also likely made the belts even harder to slide along the cones. This really got me thinking that a mechanism like this, where a belt has to slide along cones, would always suffer from slipping problems, because you need high enough friction that the belt doesn't slip, and yet low enough friction that can easily slide from side to side along the cones. But what if I didn't need the belt to slide sideways? What if the belt wheels themselves could change size? And since the belt doesn't have to slide sideways anymore, I can use a wide and thick rubber band on it, which should hopefully slip a lot less. Right now, the wheel connected to the input, which is this one, is at its smallest size, while the output wheel is a lot bigger, so the output turns slower, but with more torque. And if I change the sizes of the wheels, you can see that the output is turning faster and faster, since I'm continuously varying the relative sizes of the wheels, which varies their gear ratio. To make these size changing wheels, I went through lots of different designs before I came up with this one. I needed the design to be as compact as possible, especially in its smallest position, so that, relative to that, its diameter can increase by the largest amount to give us as big a range of gear ratios as possible. I also tried to make these wheels as spherical as I could, even in the more open positions. But of course, I couldn't get them to be perfectly spherical, and this unfortunately created a pretty big problem once I had two of them connected like this. You see, since the wheel isn't perfectly round, some of the time it stretches the rubber band further back, and at other times it lets it become a bit more slack. The problem with this is that, if I make the belt quite tight so it doesn't slip, the motor really struggles to turn it at the points when the rubber band gets stretched more. Here I don't have it stretched too tight, which unfortunately means the band still slips if I apply enough force, but even this way the motor is struggling a bit. If I turn it by hand, I can tell that it's got a lot more friction than the previous CVTs, 
This is bad enough that it feels like at least half of the force I'm giving to the input is just being wasted pulling the rubber band back and forth as I turn it. But if I make the belt looser, it will just start slipping more. My first thought was to make the belt slightly looser, but then to replace these curved segments of the wheels with rougher ones, so the belt hopefully grips them better. Unlike on the cone-based CVT designs, this is fine to do here, because the belt doesn't have to slide sideways, so the stronger grip can only help its performance. This definitely reduced the friction by a lot, and when turning the input manually, I could tell that there was way less resistance in the mechanism. And as for the slipping, in the high gears I really noticed that it was way harder to stop the output axle, and the motor was actually stalling rather than the belt slipping. But when I changed to the lower gears, I found that unfortunately the belt was still slipping pretty easily. At this point, I was really thinking that as long as I was using these rubber belts, I would never be able to get around these slipping issues. But then I started wondering, since the belt doesn't have to slide sideways anymore, would it be possible to use a chain instead? I knew that if I could get this to work, it would fix the issue of slipping once and for all, and have way lower friction than using a belt. I had to give it a try. My first thought on how to drive the chain was just to add these fixed gears to each segment of the wheels, so that they're also free to move in and out. At first it seemed like this was working just fine. But when I tried changing gear ratio, I realised that the chain would stop this wheel from getting any bigger, because these two gears would need to spread further apart, but the chain is holding them together. This is a side effect of the fact that the chain won't ever slip at all, so it's forcing the wheel to stay at this size, whereas when it used a belt, we were actually relying on it slipping a bit here to let the wheel open up. To fix this, I came up with this design instead. It's got this little hook piece, which I've positioned carefully so it will only attach onto the chain when it's pulling it in this direction. But if I pull the chain the other way, it just slips over the hook and can keep moving freely. This way, when I make the wheel bigger, you can imagine that, since the chain is now too small for the size of the wheel, it's going to try to move this way here, and this way here, to give itself more space as the wheel gets bigger. And whereas before it couldn't slide in either direction, now, it still can't move this way at the bottom because the hook is still stopping it, but it can slide further this way at the top because it's sliding away from the angle of the hook. The result is that the wheel can change size just fine, and the same goes for the output wheel because I've used the same hook design there, just flipped around so that the chain can pull on the wheel rather than the wheel pulling on the chain, like has to happen here. And if I connect on a motor, you can see that it runs really smoothly, and I can easily change the gear ratio without anything getting stuck. And most importantly, the chain will never slip. So far, I've been using this lever to manually change the gear ratio of the CVT, but the more I looked at this design, the more I thought that automating it wouldn't be too hard, and might actually make the design simpler. And by automating it, I mean it would automatically change to a lower gear if I apply more resistance to the output. So if I'm about to remove this manual gear changer mechanism, I thought I'd first quickly explain how it works to vary the sizes of the wheels. The way these wheels open or close is by rotating the axles sticking out of each side relative to one another. How I've configured the wheels on this machine was to have the right side of the wheel driven through this turntable piece like this, and the left half being driven through an axle coming inside the turntable to here, so both halves can be rotated independently from this side. All I've done here is connect the turntable directly to the input through these gears, but the inner axle is connected to the input through this differential, when the differential housing is fixed, both the turntable and the inner axle turn an equal amount, so the wheel doesn't change size. But if I rotate the differential housing, it forces the inner axle, and therefore the left half of the wheel, to turn slightly further than the right half, so the wheel changes size. And since I've mirrored the design for the output wheel, turning the differential the same way makes the two wheels get oppositely bigger or smaller. So, with all that explained, let's get rid of all of it, since we don't need it anymore if we're turning this into an automatic CVT. And you know how I said that shouldn't be too hard? 
Well, I had to modify the wheel designs very slightly, and then it's as simple as attaching on a rubber band between these linkages on the input wheel to try and hold it open. Eh, that's a bit weak, so I'll add on a second one on another part of the wheel to make it a bit stronger. And that's all it takes. So, just like before, this arm shows the speed of the input, and this arm is the CVT's output. Why don't I show this working a little first? Because then it will be a lot easier to explain what's going on here. You can see that, if I apply some resistance to the output axle, the wheels automatically change size, which increases the gear ratio so the output has more torque but at a lower speed. So what's going on here? You know how I mentioned before that for the wheels to change size their left and right halves need to be rotated relative to one another? Well, the input axle is driving the right side half of the input wheel, while the left half isn't connected to anything with the wheels being held in its fully open position because these rubber bands are holding it open. And since the wheel is rotating clockwise, as it moves and the chain catches on each of these arms, it's trying to pull them this way. And as it pulls this way, it just so happens that, if I hold the right side of the wheel still, the chain pulling on these arms also acts to rotate the left half of the wheel relative to the right half, which causes the wheel to shrink. The trick here is that, in order to shrink, it has to force these rubber bands to stretch, and this happens more the higher the forces that the chain is exerting on the arm, which increases as the output torque increases. But of course, if this wheel just shrinks but the other one stays the same size, the chain will get really slack, so we want the output wheel to get bigger as the input wheel gets smaller. And luckily for us, the wheel is actually trying to do this anyway. This is because, whereas on the input wheel the chain is pulling this way, which tries to make the wheel smaller, on the output wheel the chain is pulling it this way, which, if I hold this wheel small, means that the chain pulling it clockwise actually tries to make it bigger. But since the chain is fairly taut, there isn't room for it to get bigger unless the input wheel gets smaller, which only happens if the elastic bands stretch. So, all of this means that if we apply enough force to the output axle to make the elastic band stretch, it makes the input wheel get smaller, which in turn allows the output wheel to get bigger. And this allows the output to turn slower but with more torque as the gear ratio automatically increases. And this gear ratio can vary continuously depending on how much resistance we apply to the output. I know that this was a bit of a drawn out explanation, but as I was working on this I was just really amazed that the whole process of automating it seemed to fall into place perfectly, even though, like I said before, I'd initially designed this purely as a manual CVT. And as a bonus, it's got essentially no friction, since the chain doesn't need to maintain tension like the rubber band CVTs did. Now, I've got lots of ideas for things I'd like to try out with this mechanism, like putting it in a car for one thing. And as well as that, I thought it would be really cool to try and build some kind of torque measuring device, so that then I could connect one to the input and one to the output of this mechanism. That way, when I increase the output torque, I could see if the input torque does in fact stay pretty constant thanks to the automatically changing gear ratio. But designing and building that, as well as testing the CVT out in some vehicles and what have you, is a pretty big job in itself, and is probably enough to be worth its own video. So, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So, I'm going to call this video here, and save all of that for the next one. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you then.